Hello, and thanks everyone for joining us for this talk today. My name is Thomas Johnson. I'm the curator of performance and moving image at Dunlop Art Gallery. I'd like to acknowledge that Dunlop Art Gallery is located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, and the homeland of the Métis. I also thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territory. On the behalf of the Dunlop Art Gallery, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this artist talk by Hazel Meyer, whose installation Muscle Panic is exhibited here from October 23rd to January 24th. After this talk, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A, and I invite you to provide your answers in the chat bar, um, and we'll select those and uh, respond to them. I'd also like to thank our partner in this exhibit, Sask Sport, and in particular, Kia Scholar, who's been instrumental in supporting Hazel through an online engagement with Saskatchewan-based athletes, which will culminate in a publication in the new year. And I'd also like to thank Robin Alex McDonald, who contributed a, an insightful essay, which can be seen on our website under Dunlop Learning. And now again, it's my pleasure to introduce Hazel Meyer. Hazel is an artist whose work with works with installation, performance, and text to investigate the relationship between sexuality, feminism, and material culture. Her work recovers the queer aesthetics, politics, and bodies often defaced within histories of infrastructure, athletics, and illness. Drawing on archival research, she designs immersive installations that brings various troublemakers, lesbians, fe feminists, gender outlaws, leather dykes, into a performative space that centers desire, queerness, and sweat. Thanks very much for joining us today, Hazel. Ah, uh, thank you, Tom. Ah, this is <laughs> my first um, kind of Zoom talk. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking to you, Thomas, knowing that perhaps there are other people out there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just want to do some really quick thank yous, um, quick thank yous that are actually very deep and meaningful and not quick at all, but just, you know, for time's sake. So I'd like to thank um, the Dunlop Art Gallery and Thomas Johnson for um, inviting me to present Muscle Panic and in particular for being so kind of flexible and in, in thinking through what live performance is and can be um, in, this, in these times we're in. Um, so I'm speaking tonight from Vancouver, where I live with my partner and sometime collaborator, Kate McKinney, and our dog, Reggie. And we're on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, we moved here about a year and a bit ago. So I've really um, felt very honored to be on this land um, of the Coast Salish peoples and to be, you know, to, to keep learning and figuring out how to be a good ally and steward of the lands um, for the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations. So yeah, I just wanted to, to start things off with that. And yeah, so um, Muscle Panic. I've been working on this project and various iterations of it since 2014. And I actually, um, in preparing for this talk sort of went through my CV and you know the different images I have of documentation over the years. And I've, the show um, at the Dunlop will be the um, 11th iteration of the project, uh, which feels wild and um, like such a privilege and such a pleasure to get to spend um, six years with this work and um, these ideas and to see it kind of grow. So my first thought was to do a bit of a chronology of what the work is, but then I thought back to um, some words I heard Sir Rodney Sir say at some point, and he, um, not at some point, it was during a talk he gave in Montreal, but he was, he was saying, you know, how you can't really tell a queer story with a straight line. And I kind of took that to understand, I took that to mean like, you can't tell uh, you can't describe a queer project with a with a linear chronology. So with that in mind, I am going to bounce around those six years. Um, I've kind of pulled out some important sort of wayfinders of the work that I'll, I'll kind of touch on. Um, and I went through the images just, you know, a few minutes ago and I was like, oh, I don't really show that many images of the actual work installed. Um, so I'll just flag that um, 
if you are interested, the internet provides, the, the website I put together provides. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, so I'll just preface it, start it off with that. And how I really want to start it off, though, is with a very short piece of text that my partner and sometime collaborator Kate McKinney wrote back in 2014. Um, so the first iteration of Muscle Panic was done in Warkworth, Ontario at the Cow Palace, which was a decommissioned um, hockey arena. And um, as a part of that project, which, which was an installation and performance, Kate and I made a handbook together, which at the time we called it a playbook. And so Kate wrote um, these amazing texts and I thought one of them um, would be a perfect way place to start. And the one I'm going to start with is um, called Contact. In sports, we touch each other unabashedly. Even contact, that is part of the game, can feel intimate. The palm of the hand rests on the small of your sweaty back as I guard you in low post. The weight of this touch is a warning. You'll have to drive past me to get to the basket if you're going to score but it's also a tactile measure of your proximity and a reminder that you're mine to guard. Like walking in the night and reaching a sleepy hand across the bed to find my lover's body there, another kind of proximate reassurance felt through the palm. Athletes rarely talk about the weird physical intimacies of sport, the way in which contact is always more than just incidental. So thank you, Kate, for that. And I'll start on some images. So this is an image from a performance um, that was the most recent iteration of Muscle Panic that happened in, um, in Oiselle, which is sort of like a suburb of Paris. Um, this is Abel um, and Baguena. Abel Baguena, who is one of my performers, and Abel has just launched um, a roll of pink toilet paper um, into the sky and is watching it go down. And the reason I wanted to start with this is that um, it kind of sets a nice tone for what I love about sport and what I love about sport, or I should say one of the many things I love about sport is ritual. And um, this next image I put up is of a football field in Europe. And there is a bit of a tradition in some places to really um, just waste, yes, but celebrate um, with a lot of toilet paper and, and throw it down and it really creates this quite beautiful um, aesthetic. And then this next image is of a goalie of a hockey team whose logo I intentionally blotted out because it needs to change and they will remain unnamed. Um, and just this sort of like this tradition, this ritual of this kind of either sort of protest or celebration with toilet paper is one I'm very fond of and one that most recently I did work into um, a performance. So back to Workworth, um, I was invited by Mercer Union in Toronto to create um, a project that happens somewhere in Workworth, which is a very sort of small rural town, um, kind of like has a weekend cottage industry thing going. And I think there's a prison nearby as well. Um, and I was taken on a tour of Workworth and the structure that really caught my attention was um, the Cow Palace. So as I mentioned, it was a decommissioned um, hockey arena. It was still being used once a year to, um, do the beef judging for the three, no, 4-H, for 4-H beef judging competition, which I just loved. And um, once I was in the space, I started thinking about what must happen there, you know, all the other days of the year when the beef judging, judging isn't happening. And I was playing a lot of basketball at the time with my partner, Kate. We had just started dating at the time and a bunch of other pals in Toronto. And I kind of just saw this um, this barn as um, this sort of meetup space that happened at night. And um, it was like this safe, kind of warm, sweaty space that you could go to to be with um, with your girlfriends, with your partners, um, what have you, um, to sort of do what you need to do, be who you need to be in a space that was safe and that could hold you. Um, so the image that I'm showing you right now is from the opening night when we had the performance. Um, it's an image from the front of the barn inwards. And um, 
Maybe I'll just go back for one second. Um, I'll come back to it in a minute, but I'll just describe what you're looking at. So in that space, um, the town of Fort Worth lent us their um, bleachers, which was so lovely. So we dragged them in. I kind of created this, this sort of, um, the stadium type um, situation. And in right in the middle is a 16 foot basketball net and hoop. And um, there are various other bits that are all around. The one you could kind of see the most is a long blue um, banner that says Girl Jock, Les Hulk and Sport Dyke. Um, kind of giving name, giving words to the people I saw kind of inhabiting this space. And so the performance that happened um, as a part of Muscle Panic was very much based on, it was very much based on um, reenactments. It was based on small choreographies that I wrote up that were in the playbook. Um, at this point, Muscle Panic really was engaged in sort of this idea of world making. So creating a space that queers and folks um, could kind of come to and, and be together in and at. Um, but also I was very caught up in what I saw as like a, a deep lack of any kind of a, a queer historical record. So I was like, oh, queers have been playing sports forever because we've been around forever. And, and where, where are the documents showing this? And um, it was around that time that I came across this incredible moment. Um, so this was in 2013. So just a year before I started working on Muscle Panic and um, Diana Taurasi, who is on the right there, um, was fouled for kissing Simone Augustus. Um, they were playing on opposite teams. Um, the world of WNBA, of the WNBA is quite small. So, you know, I'm not too sure if they'd gone to the same college, but you know, they were like close friends, intimate friends. And, and in this moment, it doesn't even matter whether or not they're queer. What matters is there's this gorgeous moment, yes, during the playoffs when, um, Diana Taurasi gets fouled for kissing Simone Augustus. And I love this moment because that, that sort of cliche that um, all women athletes are, are queer or lesbians comes true. And, and they are in that brief moment, um, whether they really are or not in real life, it, it doesn't matter because in this moment, it's like, ah, yes, this is, this is, this is the basketball world and history that I want to believe in. Um, and so a part of the performances um, were a reenactment of this moment um, played out with a referee, with two people playing, um, Augustus and Tarasi, and yeah. And uh, for each performance, there've always been five people and I think twice there were six people. And to continue on with sort of the, you know, I know I said I, I, said I wasn't gonna tell sort of like a straight chronological story, but I, I suppose I am starting at the beginning, which is fine. Um, so this is a fantastic image that really started the project off also. Um, the caption for it would be 1901, and it's a women's basketball team at the state normal college. And a normal college was where women would go to become teachers. Um, which I had to look up because I was like, wow, they have, they have incredible text on their, um, on their uniforms. But what I love so much about this image is, is that net is really just like incredible. Um, it looks almost like a, a Bauhausian, you know, um, piece of furniture with all these angles and it's extremely tall. By today's standards, it doesn't look like the kind of net and the kind of equipment we would use. And so what this image did for me was, was sort of posit this question, like what if we actually changed the equipment, then would we change maybe the way we engaged with it and the ways that one can sort of decide very early on in one's life, whether they're good or not at something like what if, and it looks there, the net has a knot at the end, so the ball doesn't come through. Um, what if that wasn't important to the game to actually get the ball in the hoop? Um, what then would we look to the sport for? Um, and sort of continuing on with what I was talking about with regards to like um, really desiring a, a queer 
sort of um, athletic past, I was like, oh, what if this is a sign? What if, you know, this basketball net um, was really the progenitor of, of, you know, this kind of triangle, um, you know, motif and, and um, you know, for the, the gay and lesbian movement and, and sort of the, uh, yeah. And so I kind of imagined a pink triangle in there. And um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with um, the pink triangle. And uh, you've got uh, a really wonderful button image on um, the right, which uh, Chris Birchall and various other folks in Toronto put together um, in response to the bathhouse raids. And on the left, you've got R Larry Kramer, who passed away recently and was a huge part of ACT UP and a uh, huge um, activist with regards to AIDS and HIV. And um, yeah, and also I wanted to show these images because that that pesky triangle just, you know, in the most beautiful fluid way is is of all orientations, pointed up, pointed down, what have you. Um, so this is the hoop I ended up making. I made it um, with the huge help of my friend and colleague, Sean Prosek, a very incredible artist and um, woodworker. Um, yeah, and it was 16 feet high. Um, once again, the net is a little un unus unusable. It's really meant to kind of be a place of, um, I almost want to say ritual, but, and, and I do mean that. It's, it's really a space in which you are meant to do everything but play the sport as it is understood. Um, it is a place to, to stretch, to put a ponytail in, to um, smell your partner's underarms, to, you know, to kind of like do all the things that, that happen on the sidelines of, of sport. Um, this is another image of that object. And this is a image of that performance um, in Workworth on that first night. So on the right, you've got my sister, Tamar, who's actually putting a braid in my hair. Um, Kate's in the back, just kind of hanging out. Uh, Lena is um, dribbling the ball a little bit. So it's, the performance has been and is always like quite unmonumental. Nothing really happens except something's always happening. Um, one of the sort of guidelines I like to give performers is, nobody at any point should be creating a scene. It's not about one person being incredibly virtuosic and, and doing an incredible feat. It's about all of us kind of being together and working together and kind of, um, yeah, just being, being with one another. And I thought I would throw a few image, images in that really sort of inspired um, and really give some currency to what I'm talking about with regards to what the performance kind of looks like. Um, I don't have the actual, any of the caption info for this image, but um, I imagine it's a basketball player right before she's about to take a, a, a free show, a free shot right at the foul line. And she's just taking her moment to kind of center herself. Um, this is all these images actually I got at the Toronto Public Library in the reference library. Um, they've got sort of an analog Google image thing happening, which is really quite amazing. Um, I love this image, just like kind of the intimacy and um, bodies overlapping. It looks almost like dancing. It's playing. It's if anybody's played basketball, you, you know where you know where your opponent is. You're you're either pressed up against them or you've got your eyes on them. Um, I don't know these two folks. Um, my friend Ross told me one day, and I, I promptly forgot. But um, we've got a coach and a player, and they're having a tender moment, which is. Um, yeah, one of my favorite. And then this is a really great drawing by Phil Jackson. Um, and it's of uh, one of Michael Jordan's plays. And there was a great article a few years ago about all of Phil Jackson's, who was the coach for the Lakers, all of his drawings. And they're quite, um, they're quite beautiful and lyrical. And I, I think of them often when I'm sort of um, working with performers to kind of um, work through what what we're doing and what, yeah, I guess what we're doing, what we're trying to do. Um, and I thought I would throw these two in. So on the left is an image from Muscle Panic when it was in Houston. And we've got Charlie Soul who's being kissed on the forehead by Lou Stainback. So once again, kind of like really thinking about these little intimate moments that happen 
off the court that happen um, when you're just kind of like supporting and being with your teammate or with your friend, not necessarily a teammate, but just like these little moments of tenderness and care. And on the right, you've got Sophie Wren and Ava Hervier who are um, tending to some hair, um, a hair situation. And that was, the, that's from the most recent Muscle Panic um, last year. And I'm going to start this in a second. So I wanted to throw this in. This is the only video I've included. Um, sadly, we don't have sound for it, but um, that is also okay because I will narrate it. <laughs> and the sound really isn't, um, you will be fine without it. So this is a short one minute video from Muscle Panic when it was done at, uh, when it was done at the CAG, so the Contemporary Art gallery in Vancouver, and I thought it would just be nice for you to get a sense of um, the pacing. So here we go. Oh, I guess I'm not narrating the semi. They're the sounds you imagine to be happening. Balls are bouncing, whistles are um, being blown. Foreheads are being kissed. Hairs being brushed. Ooh. So, yeah, that brings us to this. And this is a still um, from that performance. And the reason I wanted to bring this up. Um, so the folks you have here, that's myself on the top um, left. You've got Kate McKinney on the top right. Jermaine Coe is at the bottom right. Helen Reed is um, at the bottom left. And then we've got Vanessa Kwan. And um, with all these performances, I'll give you a little idea of what they actually looked like and how they function. So um, with this iteration in particular, we had one rehearsal ahead of time in which everybody was introduced to the different objects, the different props, um, and something we're saying, these objects, they, they are kind of slippery. I love a slippery object that is also a sculpture, um, it's a prop, it's um, a tool, um, it has function, it has aesthetic value to some, um, and I'm never, particularly precious about anything, but what I really want are the performers to feel a kind of comfort that they know how to use something. And one of the reasons I don't do um, more, um, how, how should I say this? One of the reasons I don't do sort of like a more um, exhaustive rehearsal process is because the people I work with and quite often um, I find folks, especially when I'm in cities that I'm not familiar with through word of mouth and through a call, um, I, I always look for LGBTQ plus folks or allies, um, folks that have some sort of physical practice and that can really be anything. Um, that could really be anything. It could be like daily stretching or stretching once a week in the morning, but it's like this kind of way of knowing yourself and if you're in a room by yourself, knowing what to, to do with your body. And that's really what I'm interested in. I've never worked with um, professional athletes per se, which before COVID um, sort of happened and, and laid this huge curtain on all of us um, was, one of the things I was going to do through Sask Sport, which I was really looking forward to, but I'll get more, I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, yeah, so what, where, what was I saying? So um, 
we would have a rehearsal process. Um, I would introduce the objects. And then before we started the performance, um, the performers and I would go on a run. So um, it was generally less than 5K, but um, we would go on a run that was just for ourselves. It wasn't meant, people weren't meant to watch us. Um, it was a run for us to um, work out any nerves we might have. It was a run for us to get our endorphins flowing. And um, part of that was because I, I was really interested working with people who weren't necessarily performers or actors or folks who were, um, you know, incredibly comfortable in front of other people. And um, there is really nothing like some endorphins running through to kind of um, allow for a kind of brazenness that um, I was and still am interested in. Um, and it was, oh, that's what I was going to say. So in this iteration of Muscle Panic, this was the first time we used um, a large banner and we unfurled it. And um, I had been mentioning um, tools and sort of these slippery objects. And I have had a, a love of banners for a very long time. And um, in particular, I deeply love this image, which is um, of the Young Lords, which is which was a Puerto Rican activist group, um, kind of like the the Black Panthers. They were they were sort of based on that, and um, they dropped a Puerto Rican flag out out of the um, Statue of Liberty when it was still all open. And this idea of a banner drop or a flag drop has really sort of come up um, as of as of recently um, on various statues, on various monuments and um, off of cranes. And it really is a, quite an important, in my opinion, um, tool within like the activist toolbox, right? And um, yeah, and so I wanted to use that. And one nice thing about this use of banners, and I guess a way that I work is that objects sometimes shift from projects to projects. So um, they see many lives, and one in particular is this banner um, that says the queer geometry of desire. Um, it's made out of Tyvek, and it's got four grommets on each side. It's about 10 by 10 feet, um, just with like acrylic paint on it. And um, so this has been used multiple times in Muscle Panic, um, generally at the end, sort of as a, a sort of a finale kind of moment. Um, and also banners are just this very easy and wonderful way to introduce text into, um, you know, into uh, a sort of, into a, a performance that maybe is a bit more, a bit more bodily. <laughs> um, and so this is that very same banner in um, a project that it was made for, which was called, um, where once stood a bandstand for cruising and shelter. And um, so I just wanted to, to show that this, this, this banner continues to live and it is now hanging in the Dunlop. Um, but chances are, I think it's all crumpled up so you're not able to see it, but just know it's there. Just know it's there. Um, and here is, I thought I would show this little behind the scenes um, image. So when I was making um, the banners for um, where once stood a bandstand, I was able to rent a really large space to get them done. And I was working on another iteration of Muscle Panic at the same time. So while the Queer Geometry of Desire was getting made, um, all of the red shirts that have been worn since day one um, in Muscle Panic got a place to dry out. And the reason they had to dry out is because I brought them one day to... Um, my basketball team, which is called Squish, um, which was called Squish because I am no longer a part of it because I don't live in Toronto. But when I lived in Toronto, um, a really radical bunch of folks um, put together this basketball night um, for queer and trans and any folk like allies. Um, and it was a really wonderful, wonderful thing. And so I brought the shirts one day and they all sweat in them and then, um, I was able to have that sweat dry <laughs> because all that sweat and um, all their labor and um, then became a part of the t-shirts that once again are like in the Dunlop right now um, and are also used um, during every performance. Though I must say I wash the shirts that people wear. Um, so the performers are always wearing fresh shirts, but um, I love, 
this piece. It kind of exists as its own sometimes called post game. Um, and sometimes it exists as a part of muscle panic. Again, this kind of like fluidity of these objects that I really like, they don't have to, I don't, I'm not ever interested in making things that just stay as one object and can't sort of live in this world and breathe and kind of become what they need to be. Um, I like a responsive object is I guess what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so that's um, the t-shirts that make up post game, but also make up a big part of muscle panic. And um, this is just sort of a, a nice little pairing. The, the sort of aesthetic of the muscle panic shirt definitely came from the Seattle Sea Baskets. Um, and the image on the right is just that um, it was found in the Eugene, Oregon register from December 30th, 1979. Um, yeah, so I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, and on the left side is uh, the Muscle Panic team from when we um, did a performance at the McLaren. So uh, at the back, you've got Lena, and then you've got Aisha, then you've got Kate, myself, and my sister. Um, and I also liked the idea of these shirts for many reasons, which I'll get to, but um, when we go for our run um, ahead of time, it sort of, I like imagining us as like a little um, group of small animals running together. And I guess the, the red shirts kind of do that for me. I must admit when I took the work Muscle Panic um, to Houston, I really, you know, I went over it with the people who invited me and I was just like, is it okay? Like do these red shirts read so differently in this era of MAGA? Um, and um, we worked through it and it was really um, quite lovely to have folks who were open to that kind of discussion and um, we brought the shirts and it was fine. But you know, it's like color, color is powerful. Um, and so just a little about the shirts. Um, and I don't know if I've brought up world making yet, but these shirts definitely kind of contributed from the beginning to my thinkings around world making. So kind of using objects and tools that exist in the world already and, 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 and changing them and, and changing them to suit your needs and to kind of like build the world that you need and what you need to be held by. So all these shirts have been thrifted from various thrift stores. Um, and they all are basically, you know, what you find in thrift stores, a lot of those like fun run shirts, you know, like the Trot for Crohn's 98 um, and various things like that. So I would have, let's say 10 shirts and then I'd have one shirt that was the, um, the patching shirt. So I'd cut out patches and then sew it over the shirt that had the logo on it and then, um, some of the shirts had um, muscle and panic on it, and that was out of Tyvek. But this idea of sort of covering up and mending these garments to kind of give them this new life and to bring them back to being, you know, a red shirt um, with a, able to sort of like hold this, this sort of world, this idea, this team of muscle panic was something I was really excited and interested in. Um, and this, <laughs> um, Q Rocky. Um, this kind of relates, I think, in some ways. If I love this image of Rocky and um, well, from the Rocky movie, and you know, who slice it alone. Um, but he's on this incredible sort of um, structure that is just like, I don't know, I don't. Is it plumbing tubes? It's the kind of tubing you can find at a hardware store. And so, going back to like using what is available to kind of construct what you need. Um, is something I've returned to many times and have been more eloquent about describing it um, for sure at other times, but I, I feel as though I'm probably getting across what I mean. Um, to kind of expand on that, um, I was at the Leather Archives and Museum in Chicago a few years ago, and I was looking through um, some of the catalogs for various pieces of equipment and toys and um, for various BDSM practices. And I saw a real kind of connection between um, various objects I was seeing and what I was thinking about with regards to sports. And here in particular, um, it's a paddleboard and it's kind of like an object that doesn't exist outside of like it having been made for this very um, need, right? To like consensually hold your partner down on this board. And yeah, it's just a bit of this world making that I find just so um, 
very, um, it kind of feels like everything to tell you the truth. Um, and yeah, it just like really roots my love of objects and um, my, my use of objects in my work. Um, and here's another great image. This is from the IRSFL um, documentary. And it's an image of, I like screen grabbed it. That's why it looks like it does. But um, I guess, and I should ask a weaver about this, but I haven't yet. I've just kind of stayed with this image that I love so much. Um, when working on a very wide loom, um, this person has got sort of like a sling around their arm so that their arm can just continuously go back and forth. Um, and it's just hanging and and kind of this like um, resilience. The resilience? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Resourcefulness is maybe, and resilience also, just like to kind of create the tools you need um, and that brings me to this object, which is I, just so gorgeous. It kind of looks like some Bauhaus object. Also, um, really what it is, it's like a Nautilus machine. Um, so Arthur Jones, the inventor of Nautilus, which is still around today. If you go to a gym, perhaps they'll have Nautilus machines. And so he created this incredible object. And um, not to get too deep into Arthur Jones and Nautilus, even though it is a huge um, um, deep interest of mine that I'm still like kind of trying to figure out. Oh, and look at my hat. I wore my sports hat today. <laughs> All sports. Um, basically, in a nutshell, what Arthur Jones did was um, create a kind of fitness in which you weren't only working in one direction. So if you have a barbell, you're really just pushing it up and then going down, gravity's going with you and it's really easy. So he created these cams that look like a Nautilus shell, which you see here. And that meant as you lift up, it's hard as you push down, it's hard. So it kind of like revolutionized um, the way people um, were working out and also the way bodies were developing. Um, yes, this kind of explains it, but I won't bother reading it because Arthur Jones, you know. There's other, there's more important things. Um, but the reason I did want to bring it up is because um, Douglas Crimp wrote this incredible um, sort of short text called Disco a Fragment. And in it, he talks about um, Nautilus machines um, changing the way gay men's bodies looked. And, and because the machines sort of like came into gym culture at this certain time and how um, and how sort of like this real iconic look of like a, a sort of triangular um, broad shouldered sort of body became like, yeah, was sort of developed. Um, I know I'm sort of going on a tangent and I apologize. Um, but I, I guess I really just want to go back to like sort of repurposing objects, right. And, and how we develop patterns and habits and how, and how things become just a part of our worlds. And anyways, uh, this image, this is, um, like, three images of various harnesses. And the harness is something that comes up in Muscle Panic again and again, and mostly because of my interest in it, well, as like this kind of complicated object. So um, a banner harvest, 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 um, a banner harness, pardon me, or a flag harness, um, but then also um, thinking about sort of like these um, Leatherman harnesses, right? And so, um, what I did, sort of being totally um, curious about how I could sort of meld those two things together, um, I made, I designed this and then I had uh, a friend in Toronto, Eli Campanero, who is a really great leather worker, um, make this for me. And I was thinking about, once again, like the, the banner drops and kind of these like sort of protest tools. And I was thinking about when we are at a protest or a parade. So various kinds of desire um, are being met in those two different um, environments, like how to lessen the stress on your body when you've got your big, beautiful protest sign or your big, beautiful um, parade, parade banner. And I knew I wanted to bring that into muscle panic. Um, and so this is an image of Sophie Wren wearing it. Um, at the muscle panic that happened uh, most recently in Noiselle. And I wanted to just briefly talk about scaffolds also. So this is an, uh, an image I've had in my collection for quite a while now. It's a, a school gymnasium that um, in order for the roof to not fall in, um, they needed to scaffold the whole thing. So I found that quite a few years ago and it's been really um, quite 
uh, inspiring for me. Um, oh, it's the wrong way. And I think about scaffolding a lot. This image is such a great image to just kind of show you how um, scaffolding is like um, able to respond, right? It can respond to shape, it can work around shape. Um, it's there to support, it's there as structure, but it's also quite flexible and um, temporal, right? It's not always there forever. It can go up and it can go down quite easily. And this is a great image of a Bruno Minari um, piece of children's furniture. And, um, you know, I think I really, I started using scaffolds, um, I think it was in 2017, and it was a way to kind of localize all the objects that we were using in the muscle panic performance. And also, it was a way to kind of allow for a bit of a perspective shift, but that perspective shift was for the performers, um, which are always kind of the folks I'm really, really kind of most interested in um, when we do these performances. I am interested in the audience also, of course, but I, I really like kind of prioritizing um, the performers. And this is uh, an image of Michael Jordan. I don't know from when, but like before, you know, skyjacks and various kind of, um, you know, drones, mechanized kind of um, means to kind of um, raise a camera up and down. And I just love that like this blocky, chunky piece of scaffold was like set up beside a net to get that kind of like perfect, I was about to say a money shot, but you know what I mean? Just like this really, this kind of this kind of shot, right? This like deep perspective change, and um, yeah, and I guess I'm I was thinking of like you know um, how a kind of physical perspective change could kind of relate to sort of like a more emotional conceptual one or something, and it's something like you know um, queers are strong and. <laughs> And not all, not all, um, you know, women athletes are lesbians, even though maybe I wish they were. And, you know, just like kind of thinking about structural change with regards to how it can make sense with um, more emotional societal change. Um, and this is in the Dunlop right now. This um, also I'm showing you this from like a, a high perspective. This is a balance beam that kind of goes along with the, the wooden um basketball hoop from the beginning, also kind of using the motif of the triangle to rethink and to think through and to think beyond like a piece of um, um, gym equipment. So this is a balance beam um, that, yeah, is made, uh, it's timber frame, so it can all come apart, um, which became a part of um, the performance, it coming together and being taken apart. And one, I guess you can't really tell in this perspective, but one of the, um, one of the beams is actually quite on an angle. So really asking you to sort of like rethink what um, what, a, what a beam is and what you can do on it and with it. Oh, there you go. That's a better, that's a better kind of example of it. Um, and this was also made with Sean Prosek. Um, yeah, it was a doozy to make, but it's it's quite nice. <laughs> it's quite my work is quite nice. No, but as an object and wood is quite spectacular. And um, and it is put together and taken apart with dowels. Um, and this is an image of Kate and Kate's leg and their little tattoo from when they were teen, um, knocking out one of the dowels. And so I'm almost done. I'll just rush through these sort of, I was just thinking about holes. So Kate sort of knocking the dowel out of the hole. And um, one of the banners that kind of is reinvented over and over again within the performance and within the installation is this one, which is the wide world of holes, um, which is a deep riff on the ABC wide world of sports. So kind of, you know, once again, riffing on, riffing on objects that already exist in the world and sort of reimagining a narrative to them. And in this particular case, it's holes and um, it's the holes of, of a body, which you can possibly recognize, but also it's thinking about like whole, with a W versus whole without a W and just like, how are we whole? And um, yeah. And the last thing I'll really show you is um, this piece, which is called Non-Archival -arch non Archive, which um, is, a, is a part of Muscle Panic. It kind of exists, coexists with it. And um, it is a collection of images from since 2014 to now that I've collected that kind of create um, 
an archive of what I, me, myself consider sort of like the greatest sporting moment. So thinking about, you know, at the end of the year, ESPN will have like the 100 greatest moments and sort of thinking beyond that, thinking beyond the 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 NBA or the NFL or the, the white male athlete, or just thinking about what has, um, oh, sorry, what has, um, what has sort of like informed muscle panic, what informs and nurtures and excites and, um, you know, provokes my understanding of sports. Um, it's something that I'll be working with um, some athletes from SAS sport um, via SAS sport, I should say, um, to sort of develop it more a bit more and to just really, you know, rethink what this idea of like um, the greatest moments are and what an archive is and um, just really kind of expanding it. And once again, you know, not following a kind of straight chronology, not um, dealing with any metadata, um, you know, that maybe a, a more traditional archive would use. And I just thought to end this off, I know I said that a few back, but I would just show you a few of my favorite <laughs> images. So um, this is from the Lesbian History Archives. I pulled it up one day. Um, and this is my really good friend, Ross Gay, who has perfect form. That's him throwing a basketball. He taught me so much that I know about, um, about basketball. He's also a great poet. Um, this is Oh my gosh, Saria Bonnelly. Sorry, I almost forgot her name. She was like the first woman to do, to perform um, one of these incredible backflips at the Nagano 98 Olympics. I might have some of that, some of those details wrong, but just a powerhouse, really, really incredible um, from France. Um, a great screenshot from The Simpsons. Um, I'm sure you get the joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. And then this is a uh, Jill Posner artwork. And um, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Hazel. This is fantastic. Um, as mentioned, we have um, space and time for um, questions and I do see some coming up here. Um, so this is from Bridget Moser, who's asking, thinking about this idea of using whatever is available to make things work, I'm wondering what Hazel's experience the last seven months have been artistically. Oh, hi, Bridget. Um, that's a great question. Um, oh, geez, I don't even know if I have anything like deeply thoughtful to say about that. Um, Artistically, yeah. Um, hmm. Well, okay. I, I think I figured out. I okay. Great question, and here's how I can answer it. I think my impulse is always to kind of find things on my own, um, and when I need inspiration, or when I'm procrastinating, or when I feel sad, I go thrift store shopping, and I like being around junk and janky things and nice things and all that. And I really needed um, four moving blankets, use moving blankets. Um, and I needed them back in July to put something together for September. And it was this kind of incredible moment where I was like, I, I'm not going, I'm not doing my regular thing. I'm, I can't. I'm like deeply immunocompromised. And I was like, Hazel, don't. So um, I did something I'm generally not that comfortable with. And I like reached out to people and I, I was just like, I need this thing. Can you keep your eyes open? And lucky enough, um, my friend, Vanessa Kwan, um, their partner, Elaine Miller, who has lived in Vancouver a very long time and has this incredible network of people put out a call via her networks and like found me within a week these four moving blankets that um, from her ex-girlfriend that I swear have like the dander of like a thousand lesbians in them from like all the U-Haul moves. Like the, it was just like such a gift. And I had this moment where I was like, oh, you know, this was so out of my wheelhouse. Like I'm very much like, I need to find it. I can't find it. I don't want to bug anyone. And this was a really nice moment to be like, oh, it's, it's like, you know, ask your community, Ham, you know, like really, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was a really nice prompt. Thank you. Thanks, we have a, another question. Um, if you can tell us more about the workshops that you're doing with Sask Sport. 
Sure, yeah. So um, after pretty early on, we realized that um, that uh, performances weren't gonna happen because you know the performances are sort of really based around like intimacy and breathing in each other's face and being inside. So it was very obvious that wasn't gonna work. And I've been wanting to, um, I've been wanting to um, like make a publication of sorts for a while that kind of um, draws on a few of the sort of like overarching ideas about um, muscle panic and, um, yeah, and so when we decide not to the, do the performance, I was like, oh, I think there's still a way to kind of like engage with some athletes. So I'll be working with five people um, separately at first and then together we'll meet up about three times and um, we will develop, um, we're going to do a deep riff, a deep intervention on um, this idea of like, um, how do you call it? Uh, like a, in a, a fitness instructional poster. So if you went to elementary school and they had a gym, you might have seen one and it was like, you know, how to stretch your calf. And so it's sort of like a series of, of drawings that show you how to sort of like work through different movements. And I, I think they still exist for like yoga and various other things. Um, and I'm just really interested in sort of like reimagining what that could look like in a really non-normative way. Um, and also in an absurd way, like, you know, something Kate wrote, you know, a while back that I really liked when they were trying to describe muscle panic. They were just like, you know, how do we come together and how do we sweat together and how do we be together in this way? And and so I'm just like, okay, well, we can't do all those things, but we can do other things that satisfy perhaps some of the yearnings and needs um, of those activities or like what they create. And I think, I'm hoping this poster will be that. So I'm kind of really just curious, like to, you know, I'm like very good at asking really banal questions that I really love. Like, oh, did you, you know, if they have longer hair, like do you wear a ponytail or do you do two braids? Like, and why, you know, is it so that the hair doesn't fly everywhere? Or, you know, um, I'm interested in experiences of like how equipment has felt or like how sweat has been with their body or like what, you know, what a change room has been like and has that changed over the, like, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of interested in sort of like the smaller little bits that, that kind of, um, yeah, don't make it onto those posters, <laughs> but our poster will. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad that this is happening. I know, from the beginnings of discussing the show and our original plans where, which were aligned with the, the Grey Cup, which of course is not happening now and all these changes that have happened. And then seeing the video, the performance and really missing those bodies. But I think this solution is, is I think there's gonna be some really interesting results from it. So thanks again for pursuing this. And yeah, thanks for no. the support as well. Yeah, totally. And you know, if you think about it, it like maybe harkens back to like, you know, pre-internet when you, if you were like a queer, you know, somewhere in like a small town, like, you know, literature, books, list, you know, like paper ephemera was like quite important and still is, you know? And so it's kind of nice to maybe, the doing a performance would have been amazing, but like in lieu of that, I really like the idea of just like having some paper, paper goods, you know, some paper from it to kind of like take up the space of, of desire and sweat and, you know, cause those things have been communicated with paper for a long time. <laughs> well, I think we have time for maybe one last question. And I think this is a good one uh, to end. It's a practical inquiry. Did you get the Garfield? <laughs> Yes, I did. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Emily, I did. It was incredible. I read it to Reggie. I wish we had time to elaborate on that, but we'll, we'll leave this to the imagination. Well, I'll be speaking well, with Kabuziak about Garfield in like the coming month. Okay, so Through something for us to watch. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. stay tuned, Garfield's on, on the prowl. <laughs> on the pulse, pulse of the nation. You heard it here first. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thanks so much, Hazel, and thanks everyone uh, who attended this talk. Uh, and again, welcome. Uh, we welcome you to attend the exhibition if you are in Regina. Um, on Friday, the exhibition opens, and uh, in the new year, we'll uh, have more to say about the publication through Sask Sport. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. And uh, we'll thank you. Take care. Bye.